My name is Sudhanshu, and welcome to the Swadeshi Videshi podcast, where we try to find out more about India and explore more about Indians through an insider and outsider's perspective. This week's episode is pretty timely. We have the upcoming visit of President Donald J. Trump to India, which is expected to bring out, well, according to Donald J. Trump, around, I don't know, 15 million people. I'm not necessarily sure because he keeps giving random numbers and um, uh, it doesn't seem as that many people will come out, but he's being greeted by Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself in Ahmedabad and many articles, many commentators have been discussing about the implications of this visit. What does it mean for Donald J. Trump to visit India and be greeted by Narendra Modi himself and doing uh, an equivalent of what Modi did when he came to the Hadi Modi event, uh, which is now being called Namaste Trump? Um, what are the political implications and also policy implications? And what I feel the past few weeks, I've heard a lot of talk about policy and the absence of policy. Uh, meaning that what are the policy outcomes that we're expecting, whether it come, whether it, it's related to trade, whether it's related to defense. Um, and also people have been noting that there's not much to be expected, nothing that amounts to this huge spectacle of him visiting um, India and, and with this, uh, you know, reception of sorts. So the question is, is why is it such a big deal? I believe it's politics at the end of the day. Uh, and specifically when it comes to politics, it's about uh, showmanship. And I think Trump is doing something calculated. Anyways, to discuss all this um, and more, I wanted to invite a personal friend of mine who I happen to have many political differences with, but respect nonetheless. Uh, Nathan Nenani, an incoming Cornell law student who graduated from Johns Hopkins. Um, we went to Oxford together. And I think something that really stands out about Nathan is his ability to understand electoral democracy, right? So I'm not talking about politics and policy. I'm talking about the number crunching, data inputting, and assessing, you know, how do you become the president of the United States? It's not by a social media storm about how many retweets you get, but truly, you know, the implications of winning a precinct by 10 votes might just, you know, be the winning formula of you becoming the president of one of the most powerful nations in the world. And in conversations with Nathan, I've realized the significance of, of, of voting precincts and all that data calculation, but also his ability to understand and regurgitate almost um, numbers that hold no significance uh, to any normal person, but Nitin just has it in his back of his head about a random non-battleground state that in 2016 uh, voted for Trump by how many percentages and was, you know, Obama's in 08, 2012. Anyways, I'll stop talking about you, Nitin. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to very, have you. It was a very flattering introduction. You don't need to stop. Um, <laughs> but in any case, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. No, I'm really, really excited because, uh, again, like I said in the introduction, so much has been written about this visit in both sides, the Indian media, in the U.S. media. And I just don't think they're getting to um, what the crux of this, this visit means. What about you? I think, that's, I think that's right. I mean, with Trump, he is I mean, a bit of a showman. And given the importance of the personal diplomatic element, in dealing with him as kind of countries have realized whether that's you know tailoring what they serve him at, like at various dinners to his favorite meals or just kind of um tailoring how they present information to him according to his interest and of his focuses um I, I do think part of it part of this is just very personal that modi is trying to like cultivate favor with trump given you know how personalized the di diplomatic sort of um efforts in this administration have become Right. So two things. First, when you're talking about meals, I just want to stay explicitly on the record. Trump uh, prefers his steak medium rare and also had a uh, steak company. But the second thing is, I don't believe this is this is diplomacy. Right. I think uh, and what I would argue is that this is political ambition. And it's honestly 
truly really good politics because I think both understand who their base is. Fair enough. I mean, the politics are absolutely part of this. So let's let's break that down. So um, what I consider and what I'm trying to assess is that uh, I, what I think Modi is trying to do at this point by placating to, to, to um, Donald Trump is a kind of re-energizing his own base in in India. Now, elections are four and a half years away from now, so I don't think he's worried about elections, but obviously state elections. And um, it's, it's crazy. Um, and according to this Pew Research study that came out, I think, uh, a few months ago, out of all the countries uh, that Donald Trump's popularity has either decreased or risen, uh, India happens to be the very few where it's risen, and then it's like literally increased quadruple uh, mm-hmm. since his election in 2016. So it seems that in India, specifically among the Hindus, Donald Trump is revered. Right. And I mean, I think that he's in in a way uh, trying to, or at least Modi is trying to obviously welcome Trump and, and re-energize his own face. But the question is, is then why is Trump doing all this? Why is Trump going to India what does he get out of it? Because, I mean, from the person that I know in the politics that I've followed of Donald Trump, Donald Trump doesn't do anything that's not in his favor that doesn't benefit him, right? Well, I think more than many politicians, he's incredibly transactional about things and incredibly upfront about how transactional he is about things. Um, so I don't think you're necessarily off base there. What I would say is, um, is and I think what you're trying to get at here, is the importance and the increasing importance, rather, of the Indian American community in the U.S., and um, that community is a vote bank. Okay, so let's break it down. What 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 is an Indian American? Just for our viewers, like, so what are the I definitions? Don't... Could could you repeat that? I'm, I couldn't hear that part. So, what for our viewers? Like, can we break down like exactly what is an Indian American? Right. So, someone who can like, what are the definitions we're placing on an Indian American? Sure. Um, I think um, whether it's, you know, a first generation um, immigrant from India to the United States or someone who is of Indian origin, whether that's going through their parents or grandparents, I think that's how we're kind of defining Indian American here. Okay. And more simply, uh, I would say an Indian American has a U.S. citizenship, right? And uh, the recent census, which was what, nine years ago, eight, eight years ago, um, <laughs> And, it's been a while. <laughs> and the new data suggests that there are upwards of 4 million Indian Americans uh, within the United States. Um, that mm-hmm. basically amounts to the second biggest uh, immigrant group after Latinos. Um, so, you know, what does that mean for Donald Trump? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, Republicans for years have been trying to make inroads with Indian Americans um, who as you've kind of just touched on, are one of the fastest growing ethnic groups in the United States. Um, but they also tend to register and vote at high rates, um, which is not necessarily true of some other communities. Um, so beyond that as well, the Indian Americans, a lot of hay has been kind of made about this, um, about Indian Americans as kind of an affluent sort of well-off community. So the fundraising aspect is something I wouldn't necessarily dismiss either. So, okay, so uh, I guess it's money, but also votes. Now, um, who do, like, Indian Americans generally tend to vote for? Historically, it's been Democrats. Um, In 2016, I believe around 80%, if not a little bit more, of Indian Americans did vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, So historically, um, Indian Americans have definitely preferred um, Democrats of the two major parties. And, I mean, is there a specific reason why? like policy or, or what, why do Indian Americans shift to, to Democrats? I think historically speaking, um, it, during the Cold War when India was not necessarily, you know, the most popular country in the United States because it didn't firmly put itself in the American camp, um, there were stronger relations between, especially presidents like Reagan and Nixon and Pakistani leaders at the time. So I don't think that dimension can necessarily be dismissed. Um, but I do think in addition to that, especially more as of late, Republicans have sort of been associated with evangelical Christianity, which is not necessarily something that, you know, refl- that Indian Americans can find commonality on. 
Um, I think there's also a sort of element where Indian Americans in particular are kind of in STEM careers. And there's this perception of Republicans as kind of anti-intellectual. Um, issues like this, I, I think, are partially why Indian Americans have leaned to, towards Democrats historically. Okay. And now I guess there there's somewhat of a turning point or no. Um, in the last election, we saw that around, and this is not my data. This is, I think, the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, data set. So I, I'm not necessarily what it, I don't know what it's called, but it's it's AAPI data something. And they basically uh, are a think tank policy institution that's based in one of the University of California schools. And they assess, you know, how different identity groups within um, AAPI are coming out voting, t taking part. And um, from the 2016 data they had, um, it's just that only 20% of Indian Americans voted for uh, Donald Trump and the rest were for Hillary Clinton. That's a huge gap. It is. It is. Um, I think the most recent set of data from AAPI um, did have Trump's approval rating with, with the Indian American community. Um, actually, I'm not sure if it was AAP. It was. It might have been another sort of Asian American voter specific survey done. But I um, do believe that survey, which was taken in 2018, had his approval at about 30 percent amongst Indian Americans, which would kind of represent an increase. And I, I think that's kind of the bottom line here that there probably is a little bit of movement to Donald Trump um, relative to where the baseline was in 2016. For a number of, of reasons, um, I think people have gotten used to him as president. There was kind of a lot of doomsday talk, and quite frankly, the economy is very good here right now. Um, so given sort of the low expectations that a lot of people set, I do think Trump has been some of those expectations, um, and that's facilitated some of this movement towards him. But I do think, you know, given the snapshot of where we're looking at for 2020, that you'll still see the Indian American community overwhelmingly support Democrats. Okay, but then, so, okay, so that's set, that overwhelmingly Democrats will be supported, but uh, there is a shift. Um, how much shift, we don't know, but backtracking that, you can see the amount of, I guess, energy Donald Trump has put in, whether that's, you know, attending the Hadi Modi event, uh, speaking um, to, you know, like, I, I don't know how many people attended that event, um, or the random coalitions that have, you know, popped up, whether it's the Republican Hindu coalition or the Indian Americans for Donald Trump. Um, you know, as as an Indian American, Nathan, if you were to vote for Donald Trump, why would you vote for Donald Trump? I think it's a couple of reasons. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of people do vote with their pocketbooks. And right now the economy is quite good and people, not just Indian Americans, but sort of people at large in the electorate seem to be giving him like high marks, but also a lot of credit for the economy being good. Um, so I think that would be the primary reason why, you know, Indian Americans would shift towards him a little bit. Um, I know that's, I mean, he's taken a tougher line on Pakistan um, in a way that in, in more explicit terms than some previous presidents, um, although he's sort of receded with his own personal diplomacy with kind of Prime Minister Khan, but also some of the comments he made about Kashmir and mediation. Um, so that seems to be more of a sort of wild card. Um, but I think another big one would be um, that he's taken a tough line on China, in particular, over its economic practices, um, over trade in particular. Um, and I, I think there's, there's obviously this sort of, in American foreign policy makers' part, this um, hope to um, cultivate India as a counterweight to China, but I do think um, I, I do think the tougher line on China is something that does kind of endear him to many Indian Americans. But I mean, why? I mean, uh, do you think those trade implications have a, a much better effect on, let's say, India and U.S. relations? Because um, before leaving for India, he's making statements like uh, India is very hard on us; we got to get better trade deals. So he's not, you know. If he's going hard on China, it's not like he's patting India on the back. Um, and it's funny because, you know, there's a dichotomy to, well, there's a dichotomy, dichotomy to every Donald Trump statement. But when it comes to India, it's like, he'll be like, oh, we got to be tough on um, India. But I love Prime Minister Modi, right? 
Um, and I want to kind of understand and assess why is that such a thing? Like, why does he always have to, if he compliment or if he, you know, says something of a critique or sorts towards uh, India, he compliments uh, Modi on the same sentence? I mean, it's not that different from what he does with some other countries, to be fair. He does this with Japan, too, where he'll talk about Japan and how they're ripping us off on trade. Um, but he's also very close to Prime Minister Abe. He's like gone golfing. I think Abe was the first prime minister who visited the U.S. Um, he visited Trump in Mar-a-Lago pretty early on. Um, so I don't know if India is necessarily exclusive in that regard, if that makes sense. Okay, so I'm thinking too much into it. There are no, you know, political nuances to that. <laughs> I mean, like I said with Trump, a lot of it is personal, right? Like, I mean... The, the North Korea summits have kind of been, you know, all about this personal diplomatic sort of, this personal sort of diplomatic relationship he has with Kim Jong-un. And that's sort of unique to him. But as we've kind of seen, despite having multiple of those summits and the um, visit, very brief visit he had into North Korean territory, the ball has not really been moving in the, denuclear, the denuclearization, excuse me, direction. So... I think a lot of that is just kind of personal, like personal bombast on his part. So let's get to, to, to something specific. Um, and I, this is the, the area that I really want to focus on is what does it mean when it comes to the demographics and, and the data of, of the Indian American vote bank? So, um, you know, if you were a pollster from either party, um, yeah. how significant is the Indian American vote bank? And what are some, you know, interesting nuances of it? Where should they be looking out for? And um, are Indian Americans coming out to vote? So, yes, Indian Americans are coming out to vote. They kind of vote at high, pretty high rates. Um, that being said, in terms of the 2020, um, let's focus on the presidential election for a second. I'm going to, my sort of specification there will make sense momentarily. The issue that a lot of the um that we see with a lot of the Indian American community is most of them live in states that are not considered competitive on the national level. So we're talking states like California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, I mean states like that, right? These are not states that are going to be contested on the presidential level at all by the the president and his reelection efforts. Um the second sort of tier of states you have are states that are largely Republican states, um, but do have um, fairly significant Indian American communities. So um, I would kind of define those states as Texas, Georgia, Ohio, and North Carolina in particular. Mm -hmm. um, those four states um, are, let me put it this way, if President Trump is losing one of those states, he's already lost the election um, by kind of a fairly significant margin. Um, so those aren't going to be states that decide the election, but they are kind of notable nonetheless. The states which I do think will decide the election in 2016, I mean, in 2020, are five states, um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. So the three blue wall, quote unquote, states that he flipped um, in 2016. Those three will be very important once again, along with Florida and Arizona. Um, I do kind of consider Florida to be the most tenuous inclusion on this list just because I think the president is favored in Florida, um, regardless of who the Democratic nominee is. But um, of those five states, the Indian American community is particularly notable in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Florida. Um, so I think we, in particular, those are the states to focus on. You know, I think it's so interesting you say that. Um, I have the study in front of me. So uh, there's this book called The Other 1%. And, you know, three Indian American academics basically um, profiled and, and really broke down the data of how many Indian Americans, where they were, and what did it mean. And even though it's from 2012, so the data is getting old because I think there's been, you know, an influx of more Indians um, and then obviously those that have attained citizenship. But it's funny that you say that uh, because obviously the top five states of Indian origin, Indian born, Indian Americans are, you know, the typical California, New York, New Jersey, Texas and Illinois, out of which, you know, Texas is the only red state that I would say. Right. The other four are Democrat. Um, yeah. But th that's interesting when you said these states that are deciding the election. So get this. So what the, the, the states that you said are, I guess, battleground states. Um, 
those are the same next five um, states uh, besides Wisconsin, which I'll get to, that have after Illinois, after the top five states, the next biggest population of Indian Americans. And Florida uh, with 4.5%, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Georgia, and Michigan. And North Carolina and Arizona are, I think, number 13 and 14, which is super interesting, right? So exactly the battleground states that we're looking into. And when you say Wisconsin, um, I just want to note that Madison County in Wisconsin is profiled as having one of the larger um, when compared to, in counties uh, as as one with uh, one of a larger demographic than than the state itself. So basically... These four or five states that we're considering battleground states also have an upcoming and thriving uh, population. And what's interesting is, is uh, when these, you know, this data that's laid out, they're comparing from in this book from 2005 uh, to eight, from 2005 to 2008, and then 2008 to 2012, and showing how much has increased. And I can, you know, just estimate that uh, there's probably uh, a significant more uh, increase now, but the fact that these states were at that time, um, you know, states that Obama took um, are now leaning towards Trump and that Indian American population has also significantly increased. Um, so it makes sense for him to do this. It absolutely does. Let me put it in. Let me put it in kind of stark terms for some people here. Um, according to the 2010 census, I believe the population of Indian Americans in Michigan is about 78,000 Indian Americans in the state. Trump won Michigan by a little less than 11,000 votes. So we're talking about, you know, margins that, I mean, every vote in some sense doesn't matter here. Um, the margins are kind of narrow enough that Indian Americans can play a very influential and decisive impact. And I mean, and that's why he's he's, you know, catering to them so much, um, because he understands that if it's these numbers that count, these very little numbers, then the Indian American population might just be willing to carry him towards another four years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, what's what's super also interesting um, that I was looking at is the study also breaks down in terms of um, the income per family. Right. And as we know, uh Indian Americans are by far one of the the well the richest um, immigrant community in the states, uh, mm -hmm. and what I think is interesting is that th the study breaks down in terms of counties of where the lowest Indian American family incomes were coming in from and the highest, right? And what you see is when it's when you know when it comes to the lower spectrum. Um, when it comes to New York, et cetera, you have Queens, you have uh, Chicago County, you have Bain, et cetera, in New Jersey. This is where uh, a significantly uh, low a low income family resides, right? And those are majority demographic, uh, majority Democrat, uh, Democratic supportive counties. But then, if you look at the highest family incomes for Indian Americans, right? So you have these counties in Long Island, which, by the way, you know, really goes back and forth with the with the Republican Party. You have a few counties in Los Angeles, um, Springfield, Rye, uh, Mamaroneck. Um, you have uh, areas around the Bay Area, Cupertino, Los Gatos. Um, in Michigan, you have Birmingham. In Missouri, you have Clayton. Um, New York, Westchester. In Pennsylvania, you have Allegheny. Um, in uh, New Jersey, you have Plainfield. Um, Again, uh, California, Santa Clara. Anyways, a lot of these, and then in New Jersey, then again have Bridgewater. But a lot of these counties actually go Republican. Well, and I, this is what I was kind of getting at when I wanted to kind of separate presidential versus kind of other offices. Because even, I mean, we talk about four or five swing states that will probably decide the 2020 election. Um, but there are, I mean, important elections besides just the presidential election, and not only in 2020, but kind of in the years to come. And the Indian American community is increasingly important in those as well. Um, even if we're not talking about swing states, I mean, in a lot of the competitive house districts, in especially kind of near growing metropolitan areas. So Texas might not be, you know, competitive on the presidential level, but 
the Indian American community is very important in kind of Metro Houston and Dallas in particular, as far as some of the local house, I mean, house races they have for state legislature and U.S. Congress. I'm thinking, you know, places like the Kansas's third congressional district in the um, kind of Kansas City area, even kind of Indianapolis's fifth congressional district, um, Indiana's fifth congressional district, excuse me, in the Indi Indianapolis area. Places like this do have booming Indian American communities. And Republican candidates in particular have sort of recognized um, this and are trying to take more proactive approaches um, to winning some of these votes. What would you say uh, they're doing proactively? I'm curious. Um, so I think to my point about proactively, what I meant is um, some of these areas are trending away from Republicans over time. Um, Texas, for instance, is a state where Trump did uh, did kind of see trend away from him relative to the baseline from the Mitt Romney um, 20, 2012 vote. Um, Mitt Romney won Texas by, I would say, 16 points off the top of my head. It was, it was in the high kind of teens. Um, Trump only won it by nine. That's a fairly substantial shift over time. Um, and... I think that would in the, be due to, I mean, the variety of uh, of immigrant votes, right? Um, in the case of Texas, I think it's actually a lot of college educated white voters fl flipping more so than more so than kind of increasing Im immigrant turnout um, per se. Um, it's it's kind of a combination of both, but I think the more sort of immediate issue that for Republicans has been. A lot of college-educated white voters have been repelled by Trump in this era and are, have flipped their vote preferences. Um, that being said, I think Republicans see some of these shifts and recognize that you know the status quo coalition may work for another cycle or two, but um, it, unless changes are made, they I mean will have real problems in the upcoming decade. Um, and I think whether it comes to I mean, something as simple as showing up to community events and engaging with the community, kind of um, engaging with members and understanding their concerns, their issues. I mean, in politics, a lot of this, like, lower level, so to speak, constituent contact and casework does make a big difference. Um, and I think especially Republican incumbents are kind of taking note of that. But I mean, so when you're taking note of that, like, are there any like measures that they're doing or is there any policies that they're implementing or are there any semantics you know that they're that they're contributing to or creating in their district um in their constituency that really would be appealing for for the Indian American crowd well on the latter front i think it kind of depends on individual priorities and i mean that's that's hard for me to kind of speak to given sort of the, the diversity within the community itself. Um, but I, I think for some Republicans, they have seen, you know, taking a, take, taking a more sympathetic line towards India relative to what they've been historically as part of the, and being kind of a friend to India as part of a sort of first step, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about something very recent. The Nevada um, caucus that occurred, uh, I think, on yesterday, right? Um, the Democratic yeah, they're still counting votes, though. <laughs> yeah, still counting votes. Um, but one article that came out recently, um, and it, it's by Vox, and they were talking about Asian Americans make up a big part of the Nevada electorate enough to sway the caucuses, right? So they were talking about how, um, you know, uh, they compromise about 11% of the electorate and um, they have an, an incredible influence in terms of which way they go and some and a state like Arizona as well, which is going back and forth, uh, might be able to whoever they, they kind of like favor to sway the state that way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. What are, you know, as, as someone that I consider as a pollster, um, what would you say and recommend for for parties to actually kind of work with the Indian American crowd? What should they be doing? And then regardless of whatever party, where should they be focusing? Um, in what states, one, what regions, what districts? And obviously tell us that, but tell us, you know, 
what should we be doing? Um, and I know there are incredible cultural differences within the Indian American community. Totally get that. But, you know, there's got to be some things that uh, policymakers should be doing or are doing. Sure. Um, so the first question you had was kind of what should they be doing to appeal to Indian American community voters, right? Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, I do think, I mean, I, I'm someone who kind of does focus a lot on the like trans, but not, see, not trans, the kind of issues that are transcendent in the electorate. Um, because at the bottom, at the, at the end of the day, like whether you're a Hispanic voter, a African American voter, an Indian American voter, or a white voter, I mean, everyone is primarily interested with kind of making sure they're able to make ends meet, putting food on the table, and having good jobs. Um, and so I think the economic sort of issues of that nature and um, having a economic message that appeals to a broad, like, spectrum of the electorate and not just kind of um, small sort of um, individual communities, um, particularly those at the top, is very important, um, increasingly important in our times where you see this anxiety over income inequality and um, how people are kind of appealed to outsider candidates running on a more populist economic message, whether that's, you know, Trump on the right or Bernie Sanders on the left. Um, so I do think fundamentally having that economic message that appeals to a broad portion of the electorate down is very important. Um, when it comes to individual communities, I think, I mean, like I said, like I said, there's so many differences among communities. So it's hard to kind of micro target, you know, a specific strategy um, off the top of my head in this regard. But I do think um Showing up, you know, showing concern, um, creating connections does matter a lot in politics. These small things do matter more than people give them credit for. Um, and I I would really, especially, I mean, given that I'm coming at this from the perspective of a Republican, who would like to see Republicans do better amongst um, minority voters, like minority voters, I would encourage them to just continue making these sort of ties um, um, and and really taking initiative and in ensuring that people feel that their voices are heard. That yeah, also goes a long way. You on that because I think it's great that you're saying they should be increasing ties and, and making sure they're doing this uh, outreach too. But I don't get it. A party which has a base that literally uh, embodies uh, the racist and, um, you know, elitist uh cultural norms um in their history and you know take pride upon them um then have the same base which attacks indian americans specifically um on uh obviously like hate crimes uh how can the republican party try and say that they want to outreach to minorities and i'm specifically talking about indian americans yet um be the almost reason um, and the base of an, a demographic in the United States, um, you know, white, rural, um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be just rural, but the, these people who then either physically harm or verbally abuse that same demogra demographic, you can't have that, right? Well, so this is an interesting question, and I'm kind of unsure how to approach this because I feel like there's a lot to unpack here. Um, as far as minority voters do go, um, I would say that President Trump in 2016 did perform significantly better than Mitt Romney did with minority voters, whether that was with Hispanics or Blacks or Asian American voters. And I do think part of this comes down to the change in economic message. I mean, which is why I was trying to highlight that um, earlier, just because I think I think one of the reasons why Republicans have historically had problems with minority voters, if anything, is not so much the cultural baggage, so to speak, that some people associate with the party, but it is quite quite honestly because Republicans have been seen as the party of the rich, and for most minority voters, I mean, the average 
person of color in the United States is less affluent than the average white person. I don't think that's, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily controversial to, to point out. Um, I think simply having a more working class economic message, one that works for a broader spectrum of the electorate has improved, you know, Republican standings among minority voters in the Trump era. Um, if anything, you seem to see a bit of a shift even amongst black males towards Republicans in in some of the recent polling that we've seen. So I think at the end of the day, the economic message is the one that matters the most. So you, think, that, you think the working class uh, kind of narrative economic messaging triumphs the, I, I think, you know, the struggles of adjusting and acclimating of identity politics? It absolutely does, I do. Really? That's interesting. So, um, and specifically, well, so I guess it depends on where you are within that spectrum of, uh, of immigrant immigrants, right? So if you are very concerned, I guess, about the economy in terms of, you know, how well you're doing, how well you're not doing, um, does that take a priority over, you know, um, feeling like you're accepted in the country as long as you're getting your, you know, monthly check with, you know, how many ever zeros at the end of it. So I would actually point out this is also in some ways the inverse of what we've seen on the Democratic side, right? Where a lot of these working class blue collar white voters who voted for Obama twice in 2008 and 2012, but then voted for Donald Trump, um, you did see some of them shift in the midterms in 2010 and 2014 towards Republicans. Um, and part of the attribution you can make here is, you know, when the economy was the main issue on people's minds, particularly in 2008, they went with Democrats because they blamed the Bush administration in particular for the recession, kind of the poor economic state, the outsourcing you saw in some of these Midwestern states, the job losses, what have you. Um, but kind of, when they felt more secure about their economic position, then they were free to vote on culture and voted for Donald Trump. Uh, the flip side, of course, is, I mean, people talk about the Trump tax cuts. I mean, some of the criticisms have been, well, they helped too many people at the top, like, and not enough for, you know, everyone else, right? But if that was the case, then, you know, why is it that some of these affluent suburban areas, which historically have voted for Republicans, I'm talking about places like, you know, Maricopa County, Arizona, um, Johnson County, Kansas. Why have places like this trended towards Democrats, especially in the 2018 midterms? Once again, you have an example of where people feel secure in their economic position and then feel kind of able to vote on culture. I do think that economics fundamentally are the most important consideration for people. Okay, with that, I think we'll have to conclude. I just wanted to thank you, Nathan, for, for coming um, onto the show. Um, I do think that the takeaway for me, um, even though there are differences of what we might presume um, why and who and where the Indian American vote will go, uh, I do believe that the President of the United States, Donald Trump, is visiting India because quite evidently, the Indian American vote does matter. Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. Um, it absolutely does. If I might end on a kind of final note, just because I think this is important to highlight, um, if you don't mind, just kind of indicative of sort of the, indicative of some of the efforts he's made towards getting the Indian American community um, vote. I would point out that some of his highest kind of profile officials that he's appointed have been Indian Americans. Um, so I do think he's made it a more concerted effort towards the Indian American vote than perhaps some other communities. But I mean, for instance, one of the people in consideration for the Supreme Court seat, so Amal Tafur was, he would have been the first Indian American justice. People like, I mean, Nikki Haley was at the UN, of course, but I mean, people like Seema Verma, Naomi Rao, and Ajit Pai, like people um, in very high-profile public positions um, for him have been members of the community. So just to emphasize that I think his campaign in particular does understand the importance of the community's vote and is making a concerted effort to 
appeal accordingly. Fair. And I think that the Democratic Party, too, has had uh, its share of Indian Americans in, in you know, public positions as well. But um, I do think that Trump has, has made sure that they're seen out there and there are um, quite a few. Um, on that note, thank you so much, oh. Nathan, for, for coming on. And uh, let's see how this visit goes. And let's wait until, I guess, November 2020 um, 20 to see where the Indian American vote goes.